All right, so today we are taking a deep dive into ISO 14064 1.20 wink team. Definitely not as exciting as like, I don't know, exploring a shipwreck or something. True, true, but way more important if you ask me. Yeah, no, for sure. This standard is all about how organizations measure and report their greenhouse gas emissions, you know, their carbon footprint. So it's like the rule book for figuring out who's contributing what to climate change. Yeah, exactly. And using a standard means everyone's on the same page, right? makes everything transparent and comparable. That makes sense. So like, instead of everyone just doing their own thing, we've got a shared system for tracking progress. Yeah, exactly. Like you can't really address a global problem without like a global way to measure it, you know? Okay, so ISO 14064 1.2018. Where do we even begin with this thing? Well, it's actually pretty comprehensive. It covers everything from defining what an organization is responsible for to actually quantifying the emissions to figuring out how to reduce them and making sure the data is all good. It sounds like we've got our work cut out for us. We do. We do. But hey, that's what deep dives are for, right? Right. But before we get lost in the weeds, I think it's worth taking a minute to just like appreciate why this standard even exists. You know, like why is this so important? Oh, for sure. Imagine every single organization was just using their own methods to measure their emissions. Oh, that would be chaos. Total chaos. Trying to compare anything would be impossible. It'd be like trying to put together a puzzle, but all the pieces are from different puzzles. So this standard is giving us that puzzle board. Exactly. A common framework so we can actually see the big picture. So it's about moving beyond those individual efforts, right? Getting everyone working together. Exactly. Because that's what we need if we're going to tackle something as big and complex as climate change. Right. right? Absolutely. So... To really understand how this standard works, let's get into the specifics, starting with the goal and those guiding principles you mentioned. Okay, so the main goal, it's laid out right in section four, is to have this framework for quantifying and reporting those greenhouse gas emissions and removals. It's all about giving organizations this consistent method so they can track their impact, right, and then make informed decisions. So it's about driving real change, not just yeah. collecting data, right? For sure. This is all about empowering organizations to actually reduce their emissions. Okay, so we've got the goal. What about the principles? How do they shape this whole thing? Yeah, so there's seven key principles in Section 5. Um, relevance, completeness, consistency, accuracy, transparency, conservatism, and continuous improvement. Okay, seven principles. That's quite a bit to unpack. It is, but they're all pretty straightforward once you get into them. Well, let's try to unpack them a bit. So uh -huh. relevant seems pretty self-explanatory, but completeness, what does that actually mean in this context? Good question. Completeness means the organization's inventory has to include all the significant sources of emissions and removals, too, within its boundaries. So no cutting corners or sweeping anything under the rug? Nope. And transparency goes hand in hand with that. Being open about how they got their data, what methods they used, all that. Building trust and credibility. Exactly. And then you've got accuracy and consistency. So, like, if you measure something one way this year... You have to measure it the same way next year. Exactly. And making sure your data reflects the actual emissions, of course. All right. Conservatism. Now, that one sounds a bit more, I don't know, philosophical. Well, in this context, it basically means being cautious, not overestimating your reductions or underestimating your emissions. So no fudging the numbers to make things look better. Exactly. And lastly, we have continuous improvement. This basically means the work never really ends always reviewing processes and looking for ways to do better, staying up to date, all that. Always striving to refine that carbon accounting, right? Exactly. And those principles are woven throughout the whole standard, guiding everything else. Okay, that's a really helpful overview. So we've got the why behind the standard, and we've got those principles that shape it. But now the question is, how does this actually work in practice? Where does an organization even start? Well, the very first step, and this is laid out in section six, is defining their boundaries. Super important for making sure that emissions inventory is accurate and complete. Boundaries. So we're drawing lines in the carbon sand here. We are. And there's two main types, the organizational boundary and the operational boundary. Two kinds of boundaries. OK, so let's start with the organizational one. What does that even mean? So the organizational boundary defines which uh, which parts of an organization, you know, which entities and operations are included in the inventory. It sets the scope, determines what they're actually responsible for. So say you're talking about a big company with multiple subsidiaries and branches, even investments in other companies. Mm -hmm. How do they decide what falls under their organizational boundary? That's where things get a little more um, detailed. Section 6.2 gives us three criteria for determining control. Equity share, financial control, and operational control. 
If an organization has a controlling interest in another entity based on any of those, then that entity's emissions are included. So it's not just about physical location, it's about influence. Right. Like, if you own a majority stake in a subsidiary, you're going to include their emissions even if they operate independently. Taking responsibility for the impact of their investments. Exactly. Now, once that's done, you move on to the operational boundary, which is more about the specific activities that are counted in the inventory. So now we're zooming in, focusing on the actual activities contributing to those emissions, right? Yep. The operational boundary covers all the emissions and removals from the organization's owned or controlled sources. You know, things like fuel combustion, industrial processes, fugitive emissions, anything to do with land use and forestry. Wow. So that's everything from heating their buildings yeah. to what they're doing with land they own, potentially even things like deforestation. Yep if they're involved in those kinds of activities. It's about getting a really comprehensive view of how the organization is interacting with, you know, the atmosphere and contributing to those emissions. Okay, so we've drawn our boundaries, figured out the who and the what of their emissions. Yeah. Now the big question, how do we actually measure those emissions? That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's what Section 7 is all about. It provides this framework for actually calculating those emissions and removals. Okay, let's get into it. What are the key steps involved in this whole quantification process? Well, first things first, you got to identify all the relevant sources and sinks within those boundaries we just talked about. So, you know, a thorough assessment of everything they do, every piece of equipment, every process, anything that's releasing or absorbing those greenhouse gases. Sounds pretty meticulous. It is. Yeah. We're talking everything from boilers and furnaces to company vehicles, chemical reactions, leaks, even stuff like agriculture and forestry practices. Wow. I never realized how many sources there are, even in a seemingly simple operation. It's all connected. So once we've got all that identified, next step is choosing the right quantification methods for each one. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach here? Nope. The standard lays out a few different approaches. We can use direct measurement, calculations with emission factors, a bunch of different options. Depends on the specific source, how accurate we need to be, and of course, what data we have available. So picking the right tool for the job. Exactly. Like, if we're looking at emissions from fuel combustion, we might analyze the exhaust gas directly. Or we might use a calculation based on how much fuel was burned and an average emissions factor for that fuel. Okay, makes sense. Now, what about emissions from, say, trees? Aren't those considered natural? Do we really have to factor those in? Great question. And this brings us to biogenic emissions and removals. These are the emissions and removals that are tied to biological processes, you know, mostly land use, land use change, and forestry. So we're talking about the carbon that's constantly cycling through forests and ecosystems, right? Yeah. Exactly. Now, the standard is very specific about how to handle these biogenic emissions, making sure they're accounted for correctly. The key is to differentiate between emissions caused by humans versus those caused by natural events. So like planting a forest would count as a human-caused removal, while a wildfire would be natural emissions. Exactly. And we're mainly interested in that human impact, right? How our actions are messing with that natural carbon cycle. Trying to isolate the human signal from the natural background noise, right? Precisely. And this is where those principles of relevance and completeness really matter. The biogenic emissions we include have to be directly related to the organization's actions and complete enough to capture their full impact. Right. We need a clear picture of how their actions, whether it's deforestation or reforestation, are impacting that carbon flow. Exactly. And there's a bunch of ways to quantify these emissions, from measuring tree growth directly to using models to estimate those changes in carbon based on land use and management practices. Sounds like a whole other fascinating rabbit hole to explore. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense. These natural systems are huge for climate regulation. They really are. And if we can accurately account for their role in the whole greenhouse gas balance, then we can understand our own impact better and make smarter decisions about how to manage these, you know, these precious resources. OK, so we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about boundaries, quantification methods and even gotten into the complexities of biogenic emissions. But I have a feeling we've just scratched the surface of this whole standard. Oh, yeah, for sure. Next, we need to look into indirect emissions, especially those tied to using electricity, which can be a big chunk of an organization's footprint. Now, that sounds intriguing. Electricity always seems so clean at first glance. Not always. It all comes down to where that electricity is coming from, how it's being generated. And that's where things get even more interesting, trust me. Well, you've definitely piqued my curiosity. 
I'm ready to unravel the mysteries of indirect emissions. Yeah. Electricity, it's like this hidden carbon footprint, you know? Easy to forget that flipping a switch or charging your phone actually has an impact. Right, because it all comes back to how that electricity is being generated in the first place. Exactly. And that's where Section 7.4 comes in, giving us guidance on how to account for these emissions from imported electricity, as they call it. So even if an organization is doing everything right, tracking all their direct emissions, they can't just ignore the impact of the electricity they're using. Nope, not at all. And this is where things get a bit more... Um, interesting. The standard actually gives us two different ways to deal with this, the location-based approach and the market-based approach. Two approaches for tracking electricity emissions. Okay, break it down for me. What's the difference? So the location-based approach, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It looks at where the electricity is actually being used and uses an emission factor that represents the average emissions for the grid in that location. So if my electricity comes from a grid that's mainly powered by coal, my emissions are going to be higher than if I'm using electricity from a grid that's mostly renewables, like wind or solar. Exactly. It takes that variation into account, gives you a pretty straightforward way to deal with it. Makes sense. But you mentioned a market-based approach, too. How's that different? The market-based approach lets you get more specific, you know. It looks at the actual source of your electricity and uses these things called contractual instruments, like renewable energy certificates, to track those attributes. So if a company is really committed to using renewable energy, they could actually buy electricity from a specific wind farm or solar installation, even if it's not directly connected to their local grid. Exactly. And those contracts prove that they're supporting those cleaner sources, which means they can claim lower emissions in their inventory. So it's like they're choosing their own electricity adventure, getting credit for those green choices. Ah. I like that. And it reflects this bigger trend, right? The growing importance of renewable energy markets and how they're driving that shift to a cleaner energy future. It's giving organizations a way to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to sustainability, actually make a difference in the energy landscape. Totally. But of course, it also comes with more complex tracking and documentation. You know, it's not quite as simple as the location based approach. Sounds like there are pros and cons to both. How does an organization decide which approach is best for them? It depends. Data availability, their specific sustainability goals, how detailed they want their reporting to be, all of that comes into play. Finding that sweet spot between accuracy, transparency, and keeping things manageable. Right. Now, shifting gears a bit, let's talk about mitigation. Because it's not just about measuring these emissions, it's about actively reducing them, right? Okay, let's get into the solutions. What kind of guidance does the standard offer for actually shrinking that carbon footprint? Well, Section 8 focuses on quantifying and reporting on emission reductions. It encourages organizations to implement what they call GHG reduction initiatives. So what are we talking about here? Installing solar panels? Switching to electric vehicles? planting trees. All of that and more. These initiatives can cover a whole range of things, from energy efficiency upgrades to using renewable energy sources, even investing in carbon capture technology or changing transportation practices. It's about taking those measurements and using them to figure out how to actually make a difference. Right? Exactly. And to make sure these efforts are strategic, the standard emphasizes the importance of setting targets, those GHG emission reduction targets. So it's not just about doing something. It's about setting a specific goal, like reducing emissions by a certain percentage by a certain date. Yep. That helps keep everyone focused, makes it easier to track progress, and of course, holds them accountable. It's like setting that personal best in the carbon reduction race. Huh. I like it. Yeah. Now the question is, how do we actually know these organizations are meeting their targets? Who's keeping score? Right. Is there some kind of carbon referee out there making sure everyone's playing fair? Well, maybe not a referee exactly, but the standard does require these really robust GHG information management procedures to make sure the data is accurate. Things like training staff, having clear protocols for collecting data, internal audits, even assessing the uncertainty in the data. So it's about putting those checks and balances in place minimizing errors, being transparent about any limitations in the data. Exactly. Transparency and accountability are key. And to make sure they're serious, the standard also requires them to keep records of everything, you know, creating that audit trail. No shady accounting practices allowed. Yeah. So transparency is a big part of it. But there's more, right? The standard also talks about these internal audits and technical reviews. Right. Internal audits are like a fresh set of eyes looking for any weaknesses in the system, making sure everything's consistent and catching errors. Like a carbon accounting self-assessment. Yep. 
And those technical reviews, they focus on the nitty gritty, you know, making sure the calculations are right, the methods are up to date, all of that. Staying on top of the latest science, making sure those numbers are as accurate as possible. Exactly. Now, all of this would be pointless if the data just sat in a file cabinet somewhere, right? <laughs> Which brings us to the final and arguably most important step, reporting. Ah, yes, reporting. Time to share those carbon stories with the world. And I'm feeling like we've really uncovered some of the inner workings of how organizations can get a handle on their greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, it's like we've decoded that carbon footprint, you know. Exactly. But all this data, all this analysis, it wouldn't really mean much if it just stayed hidden away, right? Yeah. That's where recording comes in, shining a spotlight on those emissions and telling the story. Absolutely. Reporting is what connects all that data to actual action, right? turns it into something that can actually drive change. And mm -hmm. section nine of the standard is all about creating these clear, credible, impactful GHG reports. Okay, so let's break it down. What are the essential ingredients of a good GHG report? What needs to be in there? Well, the standard lays it all out in a really structured way. You know, it makes sure things are consistent and comparable between different organizations. It starts with the basics, you know? Identifying the organization, the reporting period, those boundaries we talked about. Setting the scene for their emissions story, right? Exactly. Then you get to the meat of it, yeah. the emissions data itself. This is where they break down their carbon footprint, categorize it by the type of gas, the source, the activity. You know, they're not just giving us one big number. They're showing us the details where those emissions are coming from. Exactly. And the standard pushes them to be specific, you know, breaking things down by category, like stationary combustion, mobile combustion, all those things we talked about. It's like a carbon map highlighting the areas where they can improve. Love that analogy. And remember those indirect emissions from electricity? The report has to state how they handled those, location-based or market-based, and show their calculations. Transparency is key. Yeah. Absolutely. And just to be super clear, the report has to state that it was prepared in accordance with this ISO standard, you know, like a stamp of approval showing they're playing by the rules. And if they've had their inventory independently verified, that goes in there too, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. That adds a whole other level of credibility. You know, it's like a guarantee that the data is accurate and reliable. Like a seal of approval from the carbon accounting experts. Exactly. Now, beyond those essentials, the standard also encourages organizations to go a bit further, you know, add some context and insights to help make sense of those numbers. So it's not just data, it's a story. Right. They can talk about their energy use, emissions factors, any big changes in emissions from the previous report. Giving those behind the scenes details so people can really understand the trends. Exactly. And they can also talk about their mitigation efforts, you know, yeah. what they're doing to reduce emissions, how they're working towards their targets. Showing that they're actually committed to making a difference, not just measuring things. Yep. A good GHG report can be a powerful tool for communication, you know, mm -hmm. it can help attract investors, improve their reputation, all of that. It's like a sustainability resume showing their commitment to a low carbon future. I like that. And at the end of the day, that's what this whole standard is about, right? Yeah. Driving real action on climate change. It's been a journey, this deep dive into ISO 14064 1.2018. We've talked about boundaries, quantification, indirect emissions, mitigation, reporting, all of it. And you know what? I'm actually feeling pretty hopeful to know there's this robust framework out there guiding organizations towards a more sustainable path. Me too. It's really empowering to see this kind of global effort, you know, mm. everyone working together with the same tools, speaking the same language. It's about turning awareness into action. And the standard shows us how to do that. Well said. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive. Thanks for joining us on this exploration of greenhouse gas accounting. It's a complex issue for sure, but having this standardized approach gives me hope. Hope that we can not only measure our impact, but actually reduce it for a cleaner, more sustainable future for everyone. Couldn't have said it better myself. Keep learning, keep asking questions, keep pushing for progress, because that's how we're gonna make a difference. Uh